title is Simple Reminders for the Impatient. Um, because sometimes we get impatient with what God's wanting to do, and, and so we forget some of the things that he just said, hey, this is how it's going to happen. And we forget. We want it to be a little bit quicker. We want it to be uh, maybe a little bit larger. We want it to be, we just have different ideas than God does. And, and so we, we just did this thing called last week. We started by talking about the people of Israel when they went into the promised land or before they went in the promised land, God said very clearly to them, he says, I will drive out your enemies little by little, because if I do it in too great a fashion, like the wild animals will rise up and you won't even be able to, they'll, they'll conquer you. Right. And so like, he's just saying, Hey, I'm going to take this and we're going to do this little by little. And I said to you last week, I said, that's really the process in which we're taking as we've stepped into this new facility, as God's taken us into this new season as a church, like we're going we're gonna to go at his pace. And so what we see right now is we're going to just continue to take steps and little by little, we're going to begin to see things, God, God do things. Each week as you come in, there's little, a little bit more things done, right? And so every week it's fun to kind of look around and see, oh, what did we do this week, right? And so we talked about that. And and today, I really want to take some time, in, and this is going to be kind of flowing a little bit here, but I want to start by asking you a question. The question's a pretty simple question, but it's, who or what are you seeing? Who or what are you seeing? Okay? And this question's really an interesting question, because in order to understand how Jesus did ministry, we've got to understand how he saw things. And so today, this is really what this is going to be about. It's going to be about, hey, let's look at how Jesus interacted, how he um, handled crowds, how he handled individual interruptions, how all this stuff, so that we can really begin to see, okay, God, how, what are you trying to show us? Before I came up here, I wrote down a few different things that God really began to challenge me with. And, um, and when I asked myself this question, I've asked it multiple times this week as I was preparing, but one of the things he brought up is, how we see. So are we seeing things rightly? Are we, are we seeing them with the correct set of lenses? Are we seeing, because if you've been around here, I've said this before, the way we see things are often tainted <coughs> excuse me, by kind of the different narratives that you and I believe. Okay? And the narratives can be shaped by our families. It can be shaped by our cultures. It can be shaped by our religious experiences. So I said earlier, like some of you, you're like, if I raise my hands, then I'm going to be Pentecostal or Baptist, right? And I was only told that I can only put my hands here and I can, I can sing, but I, you got to keep your hands in front of the pew, you know? And I'm like, well, that's kind of weird, you know? I grew up in uh, Pentecostal, so it was like, you can, I guess, do whatever you want, you know, run around, jump, whatever, swing from, sh- no, we never swing from chandeliers, you know? Like, I, I, I would truly enjoy being in a place at one point where people have chandeliers and actually, they actually did swing from them. Or they're like handling snakes. I think that's the other thing like people put. Is that right? Like I've never seen anybody handle snakes. I don't, uh, Todd, did you ever see anybody in mission fields? Place like, I've never seen either. You know, I'm like, that'd be pretty cool. Someone gets bit by a venomous one and they don't die. And be like, oh, that's truly Pentecostal, I guess, right? And so like all these things shape how we see things. And I, like, as I was sitting back there just a little bit ago, like, there's some of us sitting in here with some lies. And these lies, I really truly believe that God wants to break off you today. I do. And some of this is coming from this place of like, okay, God, I want to see rightly. I want to see things the way that you see things. I want to have your eyes to see and your ears to hear whatever it is that you're doing. Because Jesus made it clear. So did the prophet Isaiah. He said, there's going to be some that they just plug their ears and they cover their eyes and they can't see, even though it might be right in front of their faces. You don't believe me? Look at Jesus' ministry just for a minute. There was all these, there was this big crowds around him all the time, right? Religious people, people that knew the Bible better than anybody, and Jesus performed a healing right in front of them and they still didn't believe he was the Messiah. Right? I mean, so if, if, they, could be, if they could be guilty of that, and they were walking with Jesus, around Jesus, surrounded by him, curious in the crowd, kind of in the back, seeing what's going to happen. If they had him personally there right now, like it's going to be much easier for us to go, and I don't know if I believe that, right? But yet maybe, 
if we truly begin to like refocus and we put off, take off some of the lenses that we've been told that we have to look at things through and we kind of just set them to the side, we might actually see God do something that we never thought we'd see possible, right? And so I am, I am praying. Like I said to you this week, there's two people I care deeply about right now that have cancer diagnosis, and I said, that's not, that's not a final word. It's not. And you know what's interesting is when, that was, when those words were spoken, there was nothing in my spirit that was like, oh, like, like freaking out or fearful or any of those things. And I got to tell you that there's a lot of times where I've responded that way, and I sat there responding going, yeah, that's not, that's not right. But, but just with like this, like, no, that's... So there's part of this in which when we see things rightly, we can then move in an authority in which we are, we're given th- through Jesus, right? But we, in order for us to move in that, we've got to also begin to kind of get rid of some things, okay? And so today what I want to do is I want to, I want to take us through this... I don't know why I keep looking over this. I'll just steal this. There we go. Um... Many years ago, I was sitting in a conference, and um, the speaker that morning was a famous pastor. His name's Andy Stanley, and when I was younger, he was someone that I really kind of looked up to. I kind of modeled how I learned to teach and how I preached and all that stuff, and, and then obviously, as you get older, you begin to kind of fall into your own voice, and you find your own voice, and you kind of begin to move, but at this conference, he said something that has stuck with me since that day, and Today's little simple reminder is going to be found in this little conversation, but it's also going to begin to take shape and probably come to life more than anything through an interaction that Jesus had with two individuals. And the simple statement that he made was this. He says, do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. And he began to tell this story about this woman that was in a small group and some different things that were happening, and, and she needed some help. And so their small group decided, you know what, like we can do for her what we need to do. And so they all came together and they did this. And, and believe it or not, people were jealous because they did that for that person. Well, what, if, you, if you did it for her, then you can do it for me. And he goes, now so we became, we had this little dilemma, like are we responsible to do this, you know, for everyone, or are we, or do we need to see this differently? Like, God, what are you trying to show us? And so he began to talk about um, just what did it look like? Let's look at the life of Jesus and let's look at it. And he, he said, by the time he got to the end, as he said, what he began to discover as he looked at the life of Jesus, as he read these different interactions that Jesus had with individuals, he said he began to see that there was something that happened. He says, do for one what you wish you could do for everyone so that someday, so that someday, you can do for everyone what you did for the one. Doing for one takes a lot. It takes a lot of sacrifice. If, we're, if there's a financial need, then that means something, we're coming alongside, we're doing this, and it, it's going it, to gonna, gonna be tough. If there's some emotional stuff, we're going to have to deal with it. If there's some physical ailments and things like that, like, like it becomes really hard. And so like, When you take on this idea of doing for one, what you're doing is I believe you're taking on the heart of Jesus. And here's why I want to show you this. Because today what I want you to see is that God, the simple reminder God wants to give us is this idea of one at a time. We've talked about, if you've been around New Life for a while, we've talked about this at different occasions and different times. But I really want this to be a reminder to us of what God has called us and asked us to do. You see, years after hearing this, um, this has really transformed how I personally do ministry, how I interact and how I handle different situations that come. And it comes from this story in Luke chapter 8. So if you have your Bibles, if you have the app, if you have the app, you can go on there, you can follow along with the message notes. But we're going to be in Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 40. If you don't have it, you can find it on the screens here as well, and you can follow along. But it simply says this, On the other side of the lake... The what? The crowds welcome Jesus. Because they had been waiting for him. And then a man named Jairus, a leader of the local synagogue, came and fell at his feet, pleading with him to come home with him. His only daughter, who was about 12 years old, was dying. Okay? Who do we see in this picture already? We see Jesus. We see who else? 
Jairus, 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 and then who else? The crowds. So you got three different people in here. You got Jesus, Jairus, and the crowds. And so we got to understand this as we look at this. We're going to look at, and these three, these three things are going to continue. Jairus will change, and he'll now become the woman with the issue of blood in just a minute, but Jesus and the crowds are always still in this picture, okay? And he continues on. He says this. He says, and Jesus went with him, and he was surrounded by crowds. Pretty much anywhere Jesus went, there was what? Crowd, okay? A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding, and she could find no cure. Coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe, and immediately the bleeding, what? Stopped. And Jesus asked this question. Now remember, there was Jesus, there's Jairus, there's the woman in the crowd, and then there's the what? Crowd. Okay, so here's the interesting thing. If I was walking in a crowd with you, say we're at Cedar Point, sweating, standing in lines, someone bumped into me, and I'm like, who bumped into me? Eddie would be like, CJ, you're crazy. There's lots of people around you. No, I'm like, no, someone, someone bumped into me. Yeah, of course someone bumped into you. We're in a line. We're waiting for four hours. Just so you know, CJ's not waiting in four-hour lines. CJ's at the Anirondack chairs watching everybody else standing and eating, or doing the unlimited drinks every 15 minutes, right? But he said, who touched me? And the funny part is, is everyone in the crowd, what? Denied it. And Peter said... I love Peter, okay? I think sometimes I kind of fall in Peter's camp here, like Captain Obvious a little bit, right? Master, this whole crowd is pressing against you. It's, there's a crowd. We, you don't realize that you're asking, someone touched you, someone bumped into you, but you've got to see like anybody could have. I might have. I don't know. You know, like, but what we've got to see is this. There's so many people, and with so many people, there comes what? So many expectations. And this is where there's conflict. Because there's so many people, but yet there's equally as more, if not more, expectations because of that. And my hope is, is that as a church, we don't get smaller that we can continue to grow because we want more and more people to come to know Christ. That's our hope. That's why we do what we do. But here's the thing. With more people comes more expectations, comes more problems, comes more everything. And so as a church, as individuals, as married couples, as singles, as teenagers, as middle schoolers, like we have to understand, yeah, there's... There's going to be people, but then there's also going to come expectations, but we got to look at Jesus and go, how did Jesus deal with this? It continues on. But Jesus said, someone did what? Deliberately touch me. I felt healing power go from me, and when the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble and she fell at her knees in front of him. Okay, two different stories real quick. Jarius comes to him, says, hey, my daughter is dying. I need you to come. The crowds are there, and he turns his attention to who? Jarius. Crowds were still there. But in that moment, the crowds, what? Disappeared. And Jesus focused in on who? Jarius. The second interaction, as they're walking to Jarius' house, this woman with an issue of blood, who's had it for many years, who's been troubled with this for many years. I don't know how many saw this episode of The Chosen. Okay? Were you surprised that it happened? No, sorry. Okay. That's the fun part about Chosen. Oh, I wonder what's going to happen next. Oh, wait. You know, like. But it was one of those moments where you get to see the desperation, feel the desperation of the person, and watch the interaction. And the crowd, the crowd was there. But I think Jesus was trying to get Peter to see things differently, to adjust his focus. And when, he had, when Jesus began to address Peter's thing, well, 
there's a lot of people that have bumped into you. And he goes, no, no, someone has deliberately touched me. So Peter, you're looking at the crowd. Find the individual. Find the individual. Because there is something that happens when we look and we focus in on what Jesus is focusing in on. And Jesus has an amazing way of seeing the individuals in the middle of the crowds. You see, Jesus wants us to make sure that no one goes unnoticed. No one. Now, if, if we're truly going to do this, if we're truly going to understand with so many people come so many um, expectations, and we're going to truly embrace what Jesus really wants was to make sure that no one goes unnoticed, like that's going to require something more of us. It's going to require us to step out, to have boldness, to have faith, to believe that God can meet that need of that person that's right there in front of him. So if it's healing, in the case of this woman with the issue of blood, then are we willing to step out and are we willing to pray for that healing to happen? If it's the same thing with Jairus, is it, are you willing to make that walk to that house to see that little girl healed? Are we willing to do that? Because here's the thing, like as we look at this story, what we see is Jesus takes a further step and he continues on to Jairus' house and the crowd is going, well, and, well, let me go back. So in the middle of this, like he heals this, or this woman touches him, she's healed of her, um, her issue with blood and, and then his servants come and go, your daughter's dead. And so all, I mean, you can imagine the crowd at that moment, they're like, oh, what's Jesus going to do now, right? And they're all doubting him. Oh, it's, not, it's no big deal now. Like, she's dead. Don't worry about it. And, and Jesus looks at him and goes, no, she's not. She's just asleep. And it says that he walks into their house. He grabs the hand of the little girl, and he says, I forgot the exact words, but he, he basically he brings healing to her, right? And she stands up, and she's healed and whole. Now it's on the one that he took time to like walk from one place to another to see healing brought to this little girl, like now all of a sudden the, the crowd is going, who, who is this? Who is this man? And today I really, I, I, my prayer has been like, God, would you really open up our eyes to see, God, what you want, want us to see? Would you help us to see the, the, the thing that we're supposed to like, like see so that we can do the one at a time thing that you're asking us to do? Can you take the crowd and can you like scale it down? Can you zoom us in on what it is that you're asking us to do? You see, Kyle Eidemann in his book, um, One at a Time, says this. He says, when someone stood in front of Jesus, time stopped. Everything else in his life, all his concerns, his agendas, his goals, Blurred and disappeared. And he was what? Fully present. I think if we're truly going to see what God wants us to see and do what God wants us to do, um, I think the key comes in that last part. He was fully present. No matter where he was, no matter how big the crowd was around him, he was locked in. And so over you know, the last... 10 years of my life, whatever it is since I, I heard this one phrase, it's one of those things as you begin to read the different Gospels and you read the different stories that are written about Jesus and you read it through this lens of him like focusing in on the individual, you begin to see it was, it was priority in Jesus' life and his ministry. And I, I, I constantly ask this question, obviously because of situations in my own life, but I'm like, well, why didn't, God just, why didn't Jesus just heal everybody? Because in the stories, it said, I mean, like, he didn't. There were some that came to him, and there was others that he didn't. But he wants, us, he wants us to focus in. He wants us to be fully present to what God is wanting to do. Remember, he said that he only does what he sees his Father doing. And today, I truly believe what God is asking and calling us into as a church is to really see. And then not just see and do nothing, but see and respond. Because 
let's be honest, the church for a while has kind of just become consumeristic. We come, we sit, we get entertained, and I got to tell you something, we're not very entertaining. I'm not. I don't even like looking at myself. Like, you know, so like, or hearing myself. You know, the biggest torture in life is having to like edit your message and listen to you talk. That's like the, that's like torture beyond torture. Okay. But so I'm just helping you understand, like, I'm not very entertaining. I don't dance really well. So you're never going to see me dance. I don't like, like, I just, I'm not. But what I, what I desire, what I believe God is asking us to be is real. And I I believe that God is asking us to trust him and move into some stuff and do some things that the church has kind of just pushed to the side out of fear of what other people might think. And so, as we look at this, what I want us to do is I want to ask, who and what did Jesus see? Who and what did Jesus see? He saw the individuals. And here's a couple of things I want you to just get, and then we're gonna, I'm going to try to make this as practical and, as we can. But what we see from this is Jesus is telling us, don't listen to the crowd. Listen to Jesus. Don't listen to the crowd. Listen to Jesus. Some of you, your dreams, the things that God has laid on your heart, you've put to the side because the crowd said that you weren't capable enough. Um, I've struggled, I've, I've been very clear with this, I've struggled with that majority of my life because of simple words that someone spoke a long time ago. And I finally got to a place, I think I'm finally at the place, where I'm like, I don't really care what you think. Just don't. I use the words of my mom. Who gives a rip? <laughs> right? So if you're at the funeral, you understand that one, right? That was my mom's key phrase, who gives a rip? You know? And... And part of that's true. Because the thing is, is this. I don't want to listen to any other voice. I want to listen to his voice. And I want to follow him wherever he leads. And oh, by the way, I think Jesus talked about this a little bit. Because he talked about the importance of his voice. When he said the sheep, what? Know my voice. And they respond. And if there's any other voice that tries to come in, it says that they run the opposite, they run away. The problem is, is that when we hear his voice and we hear other voices, we, we kind of go, okay, which one's more entertaining? Which one's more, like, fits my need right now? Instead of going, oh, wait, wait. That voice wants to steal, kill, and destroy. Yeah, I don't want to listen to that voice. This voice over here says, I've come to give you life and life to the fullest. And it's like, why do we continue to like listen to other voices and think that as we listen to that voice, we're just going to get more and more like, um, we're going to move more and more towards his plans. Someone told me this, and I can't remember who quoted this a long time ago, but It wasn't man who gave me my call. It was God. And so man cannot take it away either. Right? And so if God's asking you to do something, if he's asking you to step out, there's nothing that anybody on this earth can do to remove that call from your life. Now, you can sabotage it over and over again. We're all guilty of that. But what we need to see is this. Don't listen to the crowd. Listen to Jesus. Second one is this. Compassion comes when we see the crowd one person at a time. Now there's this moment when Jesus comes to this village and it says very clearly that when he came upon this village, he saw the people. And he said that they, they, they were helpless and harassed like sheep without a shepherd. He said he saw them with compassion. Like, and he was moved because he saw that they didn't know the shepherd. They didn't know his voice. Like, is your, when you walk into different situations in different places, is your heart moved because of something that you're feeling, your experience inside of you that says, these people don't know the shepherd. These people don't know the voice of Jesus. These people don't know the Jesus 
that I know, and I want them to know him? Or do we just go, you know what, they'll find it some way. Maybe I'll just give them this little invite to the church. We'll let CJ do it. You see, that's kind of what the church has done in the last 20 years. It's like, hey, invite your friends, have them sit in the seat next to you, save them a seat, tell them you're saving them a seat, even though someone's sitting next to you, right? And then if they come, you can just push them over and say, hey, I saved you a seat, right? But like, that's what we've kind of done. We've kind of go, okay, I'm going to put the responsibility on what? Somebody else. Because I, 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 my, my, I, can't, I can't tell people that. I, I'm not very good with my words. I don't, I don't know Jesus well enough. I don't, that's the opposite. My hope is that when this place is full, it's full because all the stuff's been happening outside the walls and in different places where you spend more time. At your office, your workplace, your home, your sporting fields or courts. And those places are the fields in which you like begin to declare Jesus' name. And you begin to witness and you begin to share. And then it's from those places that they begin to come into this community of people that are doing the same things, loving the same things, and experiencing the presence of God together. Like really, Sunday mornings, they should be a celebration of what, all that God's doing throughout the week. And at times they are. And other times it's like, okay, here we go. Let's pull this one, you know. But here's what I just want to say to you today. There's something that God wants to do in the room today that's going to require you to step out of your comfort zone in many different ways. There's something that God wants to do that's going to require you to pray the boldest prayer you've ever prayed and to believe that God, through Jesus, has given you authority to come against, to declare, to whatever, to see that thing reconciled in the heavens. And maybe, just maybe, we'll get to see the outpouring of it right here on this earth. One of the things that we, from the very beginning of New Life Church, that we've championed, and we call it one of our family values, is this idea of giving our best. And some you might think and go, and, oh, that's, that's like the offering. Like, we've got to give our best in the offering. That's very impartial, okay? <laughs> like, that, it's not complete, okay? And so, yes, do we believe in generosity? Do we believe in, in giving? Yes, because that's what it says in Scripture. But there's so much more to this. And when we talk about giving our best, we oftentimes go to some different Scriptures, in which I want to highlight here just for a minute, and then we're going to go into something. But it says this. What am, I, what am I getting at, friends, is that you should simply keep on doing what you've done from the beginning. When I was living among you, you lived in what? Responsive obedience. Part of giving your best is living from this place of responsive obedience. You see something and you respond in obedience to what God's asking you to do. He says, now that I'm separated from you, keep it up better yet, redouble your efforts, be energetic in your life of salvation, reverent and uh, sensitive before God. That energy is God's energy and energy deep within you. God himself willing and working at what will give him the most pleasure. And so when we say give our best, what we're saying is like we want to live in this place of responsive obedience. Like God shows us something, he opens up our eyes, he invites us into something, and we respond to it. The second one we go to is this. In Galatians 4, uh, 6, 4 through 5, it says, Make careful exploration of who you are. And, uh, and the work that you've been given. And then sink yourself into that. Don't be impressed with yourself. Don't compare yourself with others. Each of you must take what? Responsibility for doing what? For doing the creative best with your own life. There's a responsibility that each and every one of us have. As we do our new to the family class, which we'll have one coming up here probably shortly. It's our kind of our, we call it our family membership class, okay? It's, it's just helping you understand more of what we're about but one of the things we talk about is we talk about these responsibilities. We talk about your cultural responsibility and your personal responsibility and then your spiritual responsibility. We talk about those three things because we do have a cultural responsibility. There are certain things in which God has called us into that we have a responsibility to live in and live out of. And so we, we really hammer in on those. But they're part of what it looks like to truly give our best. And then I want to go to uh, Romans 12. Romans 12 is a verse we talked about not too long ago, but... Um, 
Some of you know it in a different translation, but this is, I just want to read it in this. It says, so here's what I want you to do. Keeping you, um, take your everyday ordinary life, you're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work, walking around, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Here's where I want you to really focus in on this idea of giving our best. In the second part, he says this. He says, don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit in without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God, and you'll be changed from the inside out. Here's the two things I want you to remember. Readily recognize what he wants from you, and then quickly what? Respond to it. Unlike the culture or the crowds around you, always dragging you down at a level of immaturity, God brings out the best in you, develops well-formed maturity in you. So these are two of the key phrases in which we want to really kind of respond to. We want to readily recognize and quickly respond those are things that we do. That's how we want to live. The second one of the values that I want to pull out of the seven that we have that we kind of champion is this. Is one is to influence our culture through what we call redemptive participation. I read this book not too long ago by a guy named John Tyson. He's a pastor in New York City. Um, just an incredible teacher of God's word. And, um, and he wrote this book called Redemptive Participation. Or no, Creative Minority is what it's called. But he has this one chapter about redemptive participation. And I, it's one of those chapters that I've, I, I think I have it almost all highlighted, okay? How many of your highlighters or underliners? Anybody? I, I'm, like, I'm like, okay, this is pointless. I should have just circled, okay. Um, but there's so much to it. And part of this is I want to take and break it down just a minute for you. But in John, Jesus basically said this, said, greater love has no end than this, to lay down his, uh, one's life for one's friends. He's saying, when we get involved and we are part of this redemptive story that God is writing and God is bringing to this culture, is we've got to understand it starts with here. There's no greater love than the lay down your life for your friends. And so when we get involved, what we're saying is we're in this with you. We're fighting with you. We're coming alongside of you in this. And we're not going to sit here any longer and just go, well, we'll just hope that God heals you. No, we're going to, we're going to believe. We're going to fast. We're going to pray. Oh, I said fast. No one said amen to that part. But, like, but there is something to that. I mean, Jesus made it clear, very clear when the disciples came to him and they said, well, why couldn't we do this? And he said, well, some things can only come out through what? Fasting and prayer. Like, we just go, uh, and prayer. Because we don't want to, uh, and pray. We just want to pray. And sometimes it takes a little bit more. It takes a little bit more sacrifice, a little bit more being a little uncomfortable so that we can see what God wants to truly do. Jeremiah um, 29.7, this is one of the key verses when we were kind of walking through this whole process over the last four years um, that we keep holding on to. Do good things in your city where I sent you as captives. Well, we're not really captives, but I guess we are. Taxes, a Kelvis cap. We can do whatever. Anyways, um, pray for the Lord. Pray the Lord for the city where you are living. Because if good things happen to the city, then what? Good things happen to you. When's the last time you've took time and prayed for the city? I have. Because I've been a part of a group that that's part of what we, we do. We really begin to lean into it and just go, Jesus, what are you saying about Adrian, Michigan? What are you saying about Lenaway County? I mean, we're not, we're not sitting there going, hey, here's a old list. God, would you do this? Would you do this or this? No, it's God, what are you doing? What do you want to show us? Because we want to pray your will. We want this place to be hallowed. We want hallowed be your name in this place. And so we're going to continue to lean into that. But he says, it's very clear. Like, if good things happen there, then guess what? Good things happen here. And so we've tried to honor that. We've tried to be very respectful in everything that we do because we don't want that bad relationship. We want God's blessing on what's happening. And then there's one verse that, this was a verse when I was praying um, back in 2008 about what God was asking me to do. And, and he really began to, he took me to this. And, and this, is, this is the key verse in which really helps us bring this redemptive participation thing together. And it's just simply this. You call out for help and I say, here I am. If you get rid of unfair practices, quit blaming, uh, blaming victims, quit gossiping about other people's sins, 
Yeah. Okay, I, I, I don't even know how I can't go past this right now, but can I just say the church is probably super guilty on all of those things? A few months ago, it could have taken us out. But in God's grace, he intervened. Quit blaming victims, quit gossiping about other people's sins. I said, I'm going to do a sin, or I'm going to do a series at some point called The Things That Are Acceptable in the Church. Gluttony, gossip, because they are. Like, we don't look at them and go, oh, that's, that's, that's really bad. No, it's bad. The prophet is looking at the people of Israel going, hey, quit doing this. If you're generous with the hungry and start giving yourselves to the down and out, your lives will begin to glow in the darkness. Your shadow lives will be bathed in sunlight. And this is the verse that anchored in for us to go ahead and take the faith step to do what God was asking us to do, which was move here and trust him. And it's the promise that I've held to you. It's the promise that I have written down in multiple places. I will always show you where to go. And I will give you a full life in the emptiest of places firm muscle and strong bones. You'll be like a well-watered garden, a gurgling spring. I still don't know what a gurgling spring is, but anyways, I think it's the one that's like, bloop, 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 I think, um, that never runs dry. And these are the, the, the underlines are the key things I want you to get. I will give you, you'll be like, you'll use the old rubble of past lives to build the new. You'll rebuild the foundations from out of your past, and you'll be known as those who can fix anything. Restore old ruins, rebuild, renovate, and make the community livable again. You see, these are two of the things that, as a church, we say these, these are important. So as this simple reminder to the impatient today is like, okay, what does this look like to do things one at a time? Because I know that like, there's things that God is calling us into, things that God is inviting us as a community into. I watched this at a, couple, or at a church that we were at before where like we step towards the invitation that God has. And it's, it's amazing how God works when you respond to him in obedience. It's like everything's, not to sound bad, but it's like everything's just effortless. It's because you're just really like, okay, God, you asked us to do this. And so you're going you're gonna to provide for it. You're going to do all this stuff. And so, God, we're going to step into this. And so for many years, like that's how the orphanages in Ethiopia that we ultimately adopted our oldest daughter from got started because God invited a friend of ours into this and then he invited the church into it and then the church got involved and the church got behind it. And when the church gets behind something, man, there's power, right? And when God is blowing that sail, like, man, it's like just pull it tighter and let it go, right? And so you catch the wind in the right direction and, and we can't wait to see where it takes us. And so like, as we watch that happen, we begin to see all the different things that were happening through adoption and through um, taking care of these orphans and taking care of these women in, uh, that were in uh, sex trafficking. And we watch them come out of that lifestyle and, and live in this dormitory thing. And so like that they were then shown who they are in Christ. And then they would go out and they'd have a practical way of making money now so they didn't have to do the things that they used to do. So now their life is completely changed. Their story is completely rewritten. And here's the thing about many of those women's lives. They were doing what they had been taught by their parents. So there's also generational curses and sins that were broken because of those women stepping out of it, right? And then there was also times where God invited different groups of people to come and pray over somebody and watch their bodies be healed physically. I remember my friend standing up on stage speaking just like I am right now, and he could not hear out of his right ear. He said it was a great thing when he had kids, you know? He would just sleep that way and didn't hear his wife go, hey, are you getting the kid? Um, anyways, but all of a sudden he was speaking, and all of a sudden he, just, he heard a pop, really loud pop. And it kind of, you literally saw him kind of like startle him, like startled him. And he's like, hey, sorry about that noise. And, he, and everybody's like, what noise, you know? And someone in the front row goes, 
we don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and it was, God completely heard his ear. Just that moment. I truly believe that one of the things in which God is not done yet, but God is asking us to do, is in something that I wrote back in 2008. And at some point, I'm going to give it to Alyssa and we'll, we're going to put it up, but it's, it's, it's a dream in which I believe God put on my heart for what the church that we're pastoring right now is supposed to look like. And one of the things that I said is it's a church that's unashamed of the Holy Spirit and allows him to work wherever he wants to work, but it's a place where people are healed physically, emotionally, spiritually. And there's some, there's some stronger wording in there, but not bad wording, but you know what I'm saying. Like <laughs> very uh, assertive words in there of just saying, no, this is, this is what the church looks like. And so I know that in this room, there's a lot of different people with a lot of different stories, a lot of different narratives, a lot of different things that kind of are holding you back from truly understanding and believing all that God wants you to do. But here's what I'm telling you. Watch. Watch and see what he's going to do. And so today, here's what I'm going to do. Um, I didn't really truly prepare. Katie, would you come up for a minute? And then is Janelle in here or is she and kids? Oh, you're over here. Come here. Okay. So... We had an instance happen uh, about, I don't know, two months ago? Yeah. And so I want, Janelle, I meant to tell you I was going to have you share part of this, but um, <laughs> she's like, I'm used to dealing with CJ. So, um, yeah. But Janelle's going to share an experience uh, or something that happened with her that then kind of got us involved, and then we're going to share a little bit more of this. So, Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, God's always at work, and he's, he's works through our pain and in our desires, and it's always good. It's not always easy, but it's always good, and um, we've adopted a couple times, and I think sometimes when you walk through certain um, paths in life, the Lord kind of gives you more opportunities, and through a situation... Um, Actually, with my son, number two, um, his birth mom got involved in a situation, and uh, another birth mom <laughs> uh, was pregnant and not sure what to do. And so there was a lot of crossroads that she um, had to walk through. And um, it's amazing how sometimes the most beautiful thing on earth can be one of the most difficult things. And so she called me and she said, hey, really pray over this situation. So we get, began to pray and just our hearts kind of really went out um, to this individual. And um, so she, um, one of her thoughts was uh, adoption. And so uh, we, they had asked us, you know, do you know anyone that's interested in adopting? And we've done it six times, and I didn't really feel like the Lord was saying, okay, Sarah, do it again. Um, <laughs> so I was like, Lord, <laughs> uh, what do you have here? And the, the word just kept coming to my mind, you're a bridge. I was like, thank you, Jesus. Um, <laughs> you're a bridge. And so um, I just said, Lord, you know, I'm, I'm willing to walk this. And so I actually had text. did I text you? Okay, so I texted you, and I said, Katie, please pray about this situation. It's kind of, you know, there's lots of volatility here. Uh, I felt like we were warding off some pretty heavy spirits. And um, so I, um, it was like a Saturday night, and we were in a store, I think. And I, like, looked down at my phone, and I see a text from Janelle. Um, hey, do you know anyone who would adopt a baby girl? And I was like, what? <laughs> and then totally forgot about the text until... Um, Sunday morning, I was walking into church, and I was like, I thought of someone. And so I went in there. Hold that part first. Okay. Go to the next part. Um, we're in prayer. Okay. So then um, we're in our 9.30 a.m. This is going to be a little plug. Every mo Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m., um, we would love for you to join us. We pray over the service together. So... Um, Right before we started praying, I get another text, and it says, um, this mom is 
is thinking about aborting the baby, please pray. And so I was able to just tell this group of people that had joined to pray, and we prayed that this mom would choose life. And uh, she has. And so the story continues um, of as soon as we heard this after the, everybody's holding hands in prayer, I go over to Katie and I go, you didn't tell me it was abortion. If that's the case, we'll adopt it. And she's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, like, and then Zeke comes over, I'll adopt it. And we're like, whoa. and I don't even know if you know this. Dan goes, I don't want to, but I'll adopt it. You know, like, so it was kind of like, really what it is, is like, you got to understand, if life is in our name, life has to be what we're about to, right? And so we began to like pray, and I said a name to Katie, and I said, what about Dustin and Taylor? And so Dustin and Taylor, why don't you come up here? Oh, yes it is. God put it on my heart as I walked in. We didn't, we talked about it later. Anyway, oh. I showed you guys the text. Welcome to our life. <laughs> yeah? But we, we talked, actually, we talked to Dustin first, or Katie talked to Dustin first. Yeah, and Dustin's response was, We got the text together. Well, We're figuring out the yeah, story no. here. <laughs> my, my response was, I'll take it. <laughs> well, let me make sure my wife's on board. <laughs> <laughs> but why don't you share just kind of why your heart for adoption and things like that, maybe some little bit of your past experience and things like that. So, all right, so we, don't, we ain't got all day, sorry. Um, a lot of you know my wife and I can't have kids. A lot of you guys also know my boy, that Riker that runs around here. If you don't know him, get to know him. He might give you a ticket. He'll, 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 bring, some, he'll bring some happiness into your life. Uh, but he's an IVF baby. Um, he's God's blessing. Yeah, yeah. He's God's blessings after three ectopic pregnancies, my wife losing her tubes. Um, like I said, and then Katie walked in. Sunday, and I'm like, let's do this. Like, and this yeah. isn't the first time. Yeah, and this ain't the first time. Like, we went through the whole foster care process. The lovely Lenawee County told us we can't foster kids because we don't have a well permit on our house. So we'll let 13,000 kids sleep on DHS floors every night. Yeah, which I don't know but, if you know that. Like, that's <laughs> the statistic right now is 13,000 kids in foster care sleep. Yeah. So we jumped on board. Prayed about it, prayed about it, prayed about it. Um, home study takes 90 days. We're a week in, and we're halfway done. Well, today we'll be halfway done. Um, you got, no? <laughs> what else do you want? Yeah. Yeah, so it's a, so, it's a blessing, definitely. Like. We're supposed to go to Oregon in less than 30 days. We're flying out on the 19th, 21st. Um, oh, yeah, we forgot to mention I'm from just, Oregon, too. I'm just told where to go. And how to, yeah. I, I, just, I do want to say this. I felt like when the Lord, um, I was, yeah, people started coming forward. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I just really felt like Dustin and Taylor, the Lord had this for Dustin and Taylor. And I will tell you why. Because the Lord said he wanted to reveal to them his ability. He, he is not constrained by um, attorneys, by anything that you could put in his way. And I knew that this was a situation that he really wanted. Actually, the Lord wants to grow all of our faith, right? We have to kind of do this. And so I felt like the Lord said, I want to grow Dustin and Taylor's face and I'm, faith, and I'm going to reveal myself to them. And so when I received that, I had such peace because I was really in a position where I was like, Lord, I'm going to sit back and I'm going to watch you work. And I know the church can be, um, you know, we can rally because we want life. We want, us, we want to encourage it and support it. I will tell you, adopting, fostering, that's the hard work. Mm -hmm. That's the day-to-day -day stepping into something that you're way over your head in. And so we <laughs> really, as a church community, I think we really want to show the Spirit of God as rallying around them. Because this isn't just a one-time thing. It's not just a baby shower. It's not just 
this incredible experience that they're going to have that will drain every ounce of everything that you have over these next month. Okay, it is, it is ongoing, and that's what the family is for. And so when you get to middle school, <laughs> we're going to be there to encourage them, right? Mm-hmm. We need to continue to pray for one another. And so I think this is, this is the one. This is the one that we're going to start with. I think it's such a seed because what I, my desire is that in all of this county that we would, the church, would reach out to the children, would reach out to all those that are in need of a home. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I will say this, <clears throat> um, and Janelle kind of mentioned it a little bit too, um, a lot of times what happens is adoption or and or foster care gets like glorified. And I don't ever want it to get to this place. It becomes a trendy thing to do because that did happen at the church we were at before we came here, the one that adopted a lot of kids from Ethiopia and all that stuff. And I'm not saying that they weren't supposed to, but they had a whole different idea of what it was. And when you get back and then these kids have lost everything, they've lost their culture, lost their families, like it's not easy. And so like that's where the church needs to step up. That's where like when Chloe and Psyche get here and we start youth back up, like we need people to be a part of it. We need people to be a part of kids. Because here's, let me just tell you this. Those kids back there, some of them, might be the only Jesus they get all week. Some of them might be the only hug they get all week. Right? And so we don't know. We don't know what it looks like. There's people in this room that are doing things like that on a regular basis. And, and when Jesus said, hey, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few, like, he's pretty smart. But he also said, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send workers into the fields, right? And so that's our prayer. That's our prayer in everything we do. And today what we want to do is this. Um, we're going to take some time and we're going to pray because there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on, all over, right? right? Um, and all over here. But anytime you step into something that God's doing, the enemy does not like it at all. Actually, I think it was, Kelly, I think you said last week, there is a new documentary coming out, right? About um, a whole town. Yeah, t- a town in Texas that they determined to, I think it was, you said adopt or foster every kid in their county? Yeah, the church did. And they adopted every single kid in the county, the church did. And there's a documentary actually coming out by the people that did The Chosen here in the next, I think, month or so. But it's pretty amazing. You know, it's amazing to see when the church really gets serious about what they say they believe and they start actually doing what they believe, like what happens, okay? And so we don't completely know all of what God is going to do completely. We know right now, here's the couple things. Uh, There's a huge financial piece to this, Okay. Because everything's expedited, right? That they even found an adoption agent or a, um, yeah, adoption agency that would even do the home study. And they said, we'll do it in 30 days. 30 days. You know, and it's like, okay, that's a God thing right there. Okay. And then they've already bought the tickets. They've already got all these things lined up. There's some other things that we're praying that God's protection is on that baby and over that mother. Um, just things like that, that we've... We don't, we're not going to really share here, but we're just saying, let's pray. Let's come together. Let's join together and let's just really see what God's going to do. And so this morning, what I want to do is I want to take some time and we're going to end this way. Um, I don't know what God's asking you to do or calling you into, but there's an invitation before us to join in this journey. And when we join in this journey, what ends up happening is it increases our faith. Okay. Because if it's, If God's inviting us into this, then there's other things that are going to continue to build off of this. There's two things I want to do. We're going to pray, and we're going to invite you into something with this. And then if there's people in the room that right now, I really feel like we're supposed to lean into this today. If you have a physical ailment or even emotionally, like some things are just off, we want to pray over you today. Okay? We're going to pray. And so I'm going to ask a few of my prayer friends, warriors, um, at that at the point after we're done praying with Ty, um, Dustin and Taylor, um, if some of you will come over here and some of you come over there if you're willing to pray with people, um, we just want to pray with you. And don't be ashamed of it. 
Don't be ashamed to walk over and go, hey, I need prayer for this, because we do. And this is, this is your community. I mean, if you, in this room, if we can't come and kind of do that here, then we're missing something, right? But the other thing I want to invite you into is this. Um, one of the ways that we can get involved in this, Ava, can you put, is Ava back there, or Brian? When he, can you put the QR code slide up on my message? Or Ava's there, there she is. Okay, couldn't see her. Her red hair was blending in with the purple. Um, we started this many years ago called Give Hope Now. And um, we use this a lot of times when we're um, helping people out that are in um, financial need or just in need immediately. It's also a fund that we have set up and going so that if there is needs and we have stuff in this fund, we can just immediately respond. Um, as you can imagine, this process is not cheap. Um, if you want to be a part of this financially, and here's what I'm asking you to do. Um, we are a generous church. We've watched God just continue to do amazing things in that way. If you want to be a part of it, you can do a couple different things. Either there's buckets in the back or out in the, the front that you can drop in an offering in. Or if you text, give hope now to that number or scan that QR code, it will take you to an online giving thing. Um, my wife and I both have, we're going to give to it as well. And so, like, we're just saying, hey, we want to be a part of this. We want to see what God does and how God blesses us. Okay? But today, how we want to end this, we're going to pray over Taylor and Dustin. And then we're also going to, if you guys are open for it, we got, we're going to, the team's going to come up and they're going to sing for a little bit. And then if you want to stay and pray, we'll have that. Anybody that needs prayer for healing and stuff like that too, we'll, we'll want to, we want to pray over you too. So sound good. So Jesus made it very clear that if we can do it for one, let's do it for the one. The crowds are always going to be there. They're all going to be there, but it's the compassion comes when we see the one in the midst of the crowd. You pray with me. Jesus, we thank you for the little reminder today that, God, you can give us vision to see the one right in front of us, the need that you're calling us into right now. And so, God, we thank you that a phone call was made, that a text was sent, and that, God, your Holy Spirit began to work in the lives of multiple people at the same time to bring them to the same conclusion that we have to do whatever we can to save that little baby. And so today, God, we thank you that, Lord, you have called Dustin and Taylor into this. And God, what you've called them into, God, you will strengthen and equip them for. We thank you that, God, you have laid this on their heart, not just in the last couple months, but over years. And we never knew how it was going to unfold, but God, you did. And so, God, we thank you, God, for all that you've done in their life and all that you're doing and all the things that you've brought them through. And, God, we just pray against every attack right now that the enemy is wanting to bring on their life. We, we, just, we ask that you would send your angels to watch over. You would send them an assignment. God, if more needed, God, you would just dispatch them into that place so that, God, um, they can just see your hand moving in such powerful ways. And God, we thank you that, God, you are doing a work deep inside of each of them. That, God, you're taking them, taking them to levels in their faith that, God, they haven't explored before. And today, God, you're wanting to do something new and fresh. I pray that in Dustin's life, you would just continue to renew his mind. That he would see that he's fearfully and wonderfully made. God, that you address him even the way that you address that woman with an issue of blood. You didn't, you didn't call her by any other name than daughter. And so today, God, may he just hear you whisper, son, you're good. But Taylor, God, I just pray that you would just continue to give her compassion and love, that you would expand her heart and her mind for all the things that you're wanting to do in and through her. That, God, may she see that the lie that the enemy wants to continue to, God, just put into her mind that there's an, an insufficiency in something. God, I pray that they would see that you are an all-sufficient God. That, God, you have provided and you continue to provide everything that they need. And so right now, God, we pray that as a church, God, we stand shoulder to shoulder, arm in arm with them. And we declare to you, God, that we're here. We're with them. We are being your church. And we want to see you do an incredible thing. And so, God, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for all that you're going to do. May you continue to work. And, God, we pray for our church. We pray for each and every person that's sitting in this room today, that God, maybe today would be the day that you would encourage them to do that one thing, 
to do the thing that they've been, you've asked them to do, that they would take that step. God, I'm just reminded, even as Janelle was talking, even as different conversations that Janelle and I have had about this whole process that you've walked us through. Sometimes you ask us to go to the edge of the river and put our feet in before you provide the miracle. And so today, God, I pray that we would see our feet wet and we'd be looking for what it is that you want to do. For the people of Israel, it was the parting of the, the Jordan so that they could cross. And so today, God, we just we trust you. We take those steps. We do these things little by little, one at a time. And God, we thank you for those reminders. So today, God, I just invite you in these final moments that we have, God, to show up. You already have. God, your presence is here. It's active. It's moving. It's alive. And so right now, God, do your work. Heal physical bodies. Heal mind. Heal hearts. I just feel like God is just saying, like, someone in this room, you just you keep dealing with migraines, and you just you just look at it and go, oh, that's just something. But well, I just feel like God is just saying today, that's, that's healed. Like, don't, don't keep thinking it's just something. It's something that God wants to heal. And he's waiting for you to take that step. I also just pray for our vision in this room. For some, it might be physical vision, like... We can't see things the way we're supposed to see things, but God, more specifically, I want to pray for just just for people that God just can't see. They can't see themselves. They can't see themselves through your eyes. I pray that the greatest healing today would come in that, that area right now. That they don't have to carry this label any longer of bitter, of angry, critical they don't have to carry it it's not who you've called them to be they don't have to carry around the the shame and the guilt the fear, they don't have to God you're freeing us right now and so God in this room we just ask the Holy Spirit would move in Jesus name